we should not let ourselves get sucked into that. This is what happened as the church and state started coming closer together mm. after Constantine. Christians got sucked into, well, you know, somebody has to uh, defend the border. Somebody has to rule this city and a Christian will do the best job. And eventually it became, well, obviously Christians have to do this. Christians have, have to fight just wars and even holy wars. Um, we're at a time when there's, uh, when the church is being split and, and people are getting at each other's throats and we need to re rethink that. Well, Mr. Russell, it's fantastic to have you back on the Anabaptist Perspectives podcast. Um, yeah, we interviewed you a number of times, and I'm back here at Faith Builders for a short period. So I thought we would uh, do a few more of these. And we are going to be tackling a, a kind of a complicated one. So we'll see how this goes. But the intersection of Christianity and Islam, um, and especially the Islamic empires through the Middle East, how that affected the church. And mm -hmm. just there, there's a whole lot there. You know, mm -hmm. people get college degrees on this stuff. So, you mm -hmm. know, we'll we'll see what pieces we can hit. But I'd be really curious to hear um, your perspective. Uh, so I'm going to just start with a chunk from, from your book. Uh, you write about this a little bit. It's, you know, it's not a book on Islam. It's on non-resistance. But... Um, so, and the second edition just came out, um, I might add, uh, <laughs> if people are interested in getting a copy. Um, so I'll just, I'll just read a quick section here from, uh, from page 152. Um, you're talking about the church in the Middle Ages. You said there are three issues in the Middle Ages that we will look at. The influence of Islam on Christianity, especially regarding non-resistance. Point number two, the continuing, if weakening, witness in the church to non-resistance. And point three, the rejection of non-resistance and the embrace of the crusade by the church. Uh, so where do we go from uh, the previous episode that we did with you? You mentioned how the early church was pretty much universal non-resistance. Mm -hmm. yes. How do we get from that to crusades and yeah. what we see in the Middle Ages? There's a lot mm -hmm. of stuff happens in between yes. and how that intersects with Islam. Yes. Well, uh, so you want a little bit of background before Islam. Is that uh, how that the church— That would be good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, just mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the, the early church was clearly non-resistant. And then uh, with Constantine, the Roman emperors become Christianized and they start to Christian, they start to interact with the church. This government starts to interact with the church. And so um, that causes the church to do a lot of compromises. Originally, Christians did not serve in the military or in the government. Mm. But uh, after, as the government starts to favor Christianity and eventually make it the state religion, some Christians still thinking about the earlier approach that Christianity had towards the government and the military, but recognizing that the government keeps chaos at bay would, before they became baptized, they would, they really believe in Jesus. Before they became baptized, they would serve in the military and or in the government. Then mm. at a certain point, they would withdraw and be baptized and they would not participate again. So there's this compromise that is not going to last. And as the church and state grow closer and closer together, that compromise dies. And it is, and I think the thing that did it in was around the year 400, um, constant, I mean, uh, Augustine came up with a new concept for Christians, the just war theory. The pagans already had a just war theory. Even a pagan realizes War is not a good thing. Oh, okay. 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 This is I didn't, so I didn't Cicero, realize that. So Cicero, who, who died about uh, 50 BC, he's the one that laid this out and, and uh, Augustine picks up what he lays out and then adds ah. some Christian things to it. So for instance, for even a pagan would say that, it, there, that, you, uh, that only the state can can have a war mm. that we don't feud like the uh, Hatfields and the McCoys. That's mm. not, so it has to be a state defending a state. Um, so it's a state, it's under the state's control and uh, it should be because you have been attacked, you know, you don't initiate the, the, the war. And those who are non-combatants should be left alone, women, children, old people, and you shouldn't devastate the countryside. Th these are some of the things that the pagans even said should, should be observed so that a war is at least somewhat just. Um, Augustine added to that. He accepted those. And then he added to that. It should be done in love. You should be sorry that you have to do it. And the other side is guilty of, of actually what we would call war crimes that they are, that they have actually, they've got the fault on their side. Hmm. And 
Today, that's kind of how uh, the world looks at a just war, the way that Augustine laid it out. But I don't think I don't think anybody has ever avoided a war because they said it wasn't just. I mean, and and I could give you lots of examples of cases where either during World War II, the Allies or cases where the Americans and other wars have done something that goes against this just war theory. It's once you start engaging in war, you're going to forget all those things. But so the church gradually shifted from uh, non-resistance, non-participation in government and in the military to a kind of compromise. Before we get baptized, we may participate. That's not going to last. And eventually, well, e even the baptized can can uh, participate in a just war. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, even after that was allowed, Christians still knew that blood, human blood on the hands is not good. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in the Middle Ages, in the Catholic Church, if you had participated in a battle, you would go to the priest and talk to him about what you did. And depending on whether you knew you shed blood or not, he would give you different um, uh, different penances, depending on whether you had actually shed blood or might have shed blood or had no idea for sure. Like if you were an archer and shot <laughs> arrows, you didn't know if you killed anybody or not. But all of this is to say that as the society and government drew closer to the church, as these two things came closer and closer together, compromises started to happen. Mm -hmm. And so and so by the time Islam is on the scene, it's pretty well accepted that Christians can fight. Mm -hmm. It's not the best thing. And you should only fight if it's a just war, but I don't know that mm -hmm. that has ever hindered anyone from fighting. So that's before Islam mm -hmm. comes. Um, there's already a, a, a massive compromise that's happened. Mm -hmm. Islam comes on the scene uh, in the... Uh, early part of the um, 7th century. Uh, Muhammad dies 632, and a few years after that, uh, well, first of all, when he dies, the Arab tribes, some of them revolt. They, they felt that their loyalty was to Muhammad rather than to the religion. So those Muslims that are, are uh, devoted to the religion have to, first of all, settle the revolt by the Arab tribes that have revolted. Once they get uh, sec a secure hold on the Arab Peninsula, they start to attack the Roman Empire and Persia. They rather quickly capture uh, all of Persia and even go into India a bit. The Roman Empire loses um, Syria, the middle, the middle Eastern part, but not what we call Turkey today. They held on to that. They captured Syria, um, what we would call Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Israel. Mm. And then they went into Egypt. They There was kind of a hard fight. Once they defeated uh, the Roman armies in Egypt, they went on to Carthage, close to, that was about 698. And by the time they get to 711, they're at the Straits of Gibraltar, and they cross the Straits, and they conquer most of Spain. And by, so that brings us roughly to the date 732, which is 100 years after uh, Muhammad mm. died. And by 732, the Christianized nation of the Frankish kingdom and so, of the Roman Empire, both of them stop the Arab advance. So now, the Arabs advance for, without almost any restraint wow. for 100 years, both in the east and along North Africa and into uh, Europe through Spain. Hmm. And, now, then, and, then it's, and then there's a stalemate. You, you mentioned the Frankish kingdoms. That would be where France is today, right? France is yeah, today, like yes. southern, southern France, and that's well, where they Well, it's, were... it's uh, basically France and Germany together. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Yeah. That is, for one thing, phenomenal uh, amount of conquest oh, in, in a yes. very short period of time. And also, like, that's a... So the, the Christianized Roman Empire, I guess, yes. lost a very significant portion of its territory to the Muslim yes. advance. More more than half of it. Wow. And, and, and it's so significant, too. These were... These Arabs were um, desert nomads. They weren't. They didn't have mail and you know mail armor and all that kind of stuff. But but they were passionate. They were fervent. And um, when they would capture an area, it's interesting. Um, they did not force other monophysites. Uh, I'm sorry, um, monotheists to convert. They would protect them if they wanted to stay uh, Christian or Jewish. But 
Um, there's a really interesting story about conquering a village in Egypt. And after they conquered it, they got all the people together and they gave everyone an opportunity to choose. Are you going to stay Christian or are you going to become Muslim? Hmm. And uh, most of them said, we're going to be Christian. But one young man stepped out of his family and said that I want to uh, say the uh, uh, Islamic testimony. There is but one God and Allah and, his, and uh, Muhammad is his messenger. And so this one young man steps out and wants to do that. And his family tries to drag him back. And the Arab soldiers tear him away from his family. And he does say the, uh, the creed, uh, which is just a very simple statement. But mm -hmm. that makes him a Muslim. And they did this everywhere they went. And so you had the option. Mm -hmm. You could choose to become a Muslim or you could choose to be a Christian or a Jew. But you had to pay a, a tax. OK. And you also were a second class citizen, so to speak. If you were a pagan, you had to convert or be killed or continue to fight. So they swept through these areas. They were very passionate, and that's probably what drew them on. And within, wow. the, within the Roman Empire, there was also a lot of tension between different theological schools. And so some of the Christians, they didn't fight for the Arabs, but they didn't fight for the— and I'm not saying they should have fought, but I'm just oh, saying there was okay. division within the Roman Empire— so that's another reason why mm -hmm. why a big mm -hmm. piece of it was swept away. So there, uh, by this point, and so we're talking, you know, the, the 700s or, or, or late, late 600s, 600s yeah. um, Christianity, quote unquote, Christianity and politics, government is all mm -hmm. is, is really getting mixed up yes. together. Yeah. And then you're saying there were definitely factions, internal divisions within the Romans that were saying, well, we're just not even going to fight these people. Yeah. That's, and they wow, would that's often, a phenomenal story. Wow. Well, they mm -hmm. would often make it a theological point, but it was probably more political. I talked to a Coptic Orthodox Christian friend of mine once, and he said, we believe the same thing as the Western Orthodox people. But back then it was more of a political thing. So it, it was expressed in theological terms. This is how he saw it anyway. Mm. So essentially he said, we believe the same thing, but we used slightly different terminology. And it was partly because the Egyptians resented uh, some of the things that the Roman emperors were imposing on them. And so they didn't fight. A lot of them didn't fight mm. for the emperor. And that, that, also, whoop, that also made it easier for the, um, mm -hmm. uh, for the um, Arabs to sweep through. So then, so we're you're getting an interesting thread starting here, you know, where initially the church is non-resistant, not mm -hmm. involved in the government. Mm -hmm. That starts changing. Mm -hmm. Islam comes on the scene, really devastates the Middle Eastern section of the yeah. Roman Empire, yeah. the Christian Roman Empire. Um, and then it's kind of that way for a while. And you were saying there, then it comes, the advance has stopped, you know, in, mm -hmm. in uh, Spain and on the edges of the, what would be the Byzantine Tur Empire yeah. mm -hmm. or Turkey. Yeah. It would be the edge of what we would call Turkey today. Okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then that's kind of where things were for a while. It was static yeah. for until um, pretty much the, uh, the Christians in Spain slowly were uh, chopping away and getting little pieces mm -hmm. back from the Muslims in the, East, it probably stayed a little, it, it shifted, but it stayed pretty, uh, pretty static until 1071. And then there was a big battle between a Roman army and the Turks mm -hmm. and the Roman army was wiped out and the Christian Romans could hold onto the coastline and all of the interior of Turkey basically went to the Muslims. And so then they start chipping away at those little wow. enclaves on the coast of Turkey, eventually they get to Egypt, uh, Greece and into the Balkans. Mm -hmm. So um, it stayed, that would be from roughly, that would be roughly 300 plus years that it just wow. was kind of static. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Arabs were always raiding the Christian areas. Sometimes they actually raided Rome. I mean, you know, so, so it's not like um, there wasn't battle going on, but, but the, the, there were no big shifts in what was Christian territory and what was Islamic. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's really setting the stage then for uh, some pretty significant things where um, the church actually with the crusades is saying, now we're actually going to go and attack. Yes. Like we're, we're yeah. going to go on the offensive here. Yeah. Um, and you, before we started recording, you, you made an interesting point where that may have some correlations with the concept, the Islamic concept of jihad mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so forth. So yeah, I love to speak into that. Well, yeah. before we get there, there's, mm -hmm. there's a little something I wanted to say about um, often when a, 
a, a, a tribe or a nation um, conquers other people uh, kind of out of the blue. It just mm-hmm. they, they suddenly become aggressive, mm-hmm. uh, like the Arabs did. Like they, they conquered um, this huge area and it eventually imposed their language and to a large degree their religion. It's really interesting. Um, they're usually driven by some kind of fervor, and it might just be con- conquest so we get wealth. Mm. But one of the interesting things is after the, um, the Muslims conquered all these Christian areas, for quite a while they used the Christians who had been the officials of the Roman em- Empire. Mm. They used them to administer. They, were the, they knew how to do this. The, 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 all of the Arabs were from the desert. They didn't know how to administer an empire. Mm. And also, um, they, they would use Christians to build their mosques. So the mosques looked like the architecture of the Christian church, churches wow. at the time. But what's really interesting is as uh, time goes on, the, the, the Muslims settle in and they, some of them start to say, it's obvious that the Christian civilization has some things we don't have. And so they had the Christians translate um, Greek philosophy, science, medicine into Arabic. And this fervor gets transfer- transferred, not just from, it's not just in the religion, it gets transferred into this new knowledge that the Arabs didn't have. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know how long the this would last, but there is this flourishing of the Islamic civilization, and they far surpass where the Christians are in the early Middle Ages. Their civilization is clearly, it's, it's because of the fervor and the newness of all this knowledge. Mm-hmm. The Christians had it, but they kind of weren't, well, they kind of stale, they just stuck mm-hmm. uh, where they were, whereas the um, Muslims had something new, and they worked with it. And so, when you get into the Middle Ages, the, even the Christians looking over into the Islamic world, they they would have, they may not have voiced this, but they knew that that civilization was advanced over what the Christian was at that time. Now, eventually that shifts, but I think that's important because I think that made the Christians listen to some of the things that the Muslims were saying. Islam is very legal oriented. It affected Christianity. Christianity started to shift and become more legally oriented. And the Catholic Church started doing more uh, writing of laws, etc. And it's partly through that that this whole question of of, uh, indulgences eventually comes up, which is going to start the Reformation, Mm -hmm. that it shifts Christianity. It's not that they never had any rules or laws, but it shifts them from a focus on uh, faith. It doesn't ruin that totally or at all, but it, it, it shifts it from that focus to how do I, how, what do I do? Hmm. You know, I have to do this. I have to do that. So, um, that's one shift. And when Islam conquers an area, it's it, Islamic faith says it, it should never go back to the infidel. And if it does, it's legitimate for them to launch a battle and recapture that place. And so Christians are looking at this obviously better civilization and they're hearing some of these things that Islam says. And at least subconsciously, some of this starts to affect the hmm. Christians and how they think about their own faith. Now, I'm not, I, I personally don't think it ruined the faith. I, I think it, it um, polluted it somewhat. Hmm. And one, one place that it, uh, that is, one place that it really caused a problem was, uh, the Crusades. So the Christians did believe it was okay to defend themselves. That would be a Mm -hmm. just war. But probably the first time the Christians have a crusade or at war where they try to force pagans to become Christians is in 788. So there's an obvious connection here. They have never done that before. Yeah. The, the, The Frankish king conquers the Saxon tribes in Germany. And then they throw off his uh, government and he comes in again and he forces them to become Christians. They had never done this before. That's very Islamic. You either you either convert if you're a pagan, you convert huh. or you are going to be killed. And that's so they the first crusade is actually not called a crusade, but it's it's a war that's fought in 788 against the Saxons. Uh, years later, um, the uh, oh, by the way. After a while, relations between the Christian nations and the Islamic nations kind of settle down and 
Christian pilgrims can go to the Middle East and they can visit the religious sites. Mm. And, um, and then some Turks come in and they start to cause problem for, problems for the pilgrims. And that's when a pope, uh, I believe his name was Urban, calls a council. And at the council, he says that um, our brothers and sisters in the East are being uh, oppressed by the infidel. And God wants us to go and free the promised land. God wills it. And that's the beginning of the first mm. crusade. A bunch of the men who were there promised to go and others in other areas promised to go. And they actually conquered several uh, or they co conquered that strip of land from northern along the coast from northern mm. Syria down to uh, where we would call Gaza. They conquered that area and they made it the uh, crusader states. So they were Christianized states uh, that were taken from uh, territory that the Muslims had uh, captured. Probably the majority population was still Christian. Um, the, the, the majority uh -oh. of the population in, in Islamic countries stays Christian probably for, uh, let me think here a bit, um, 500 years at least. Because there's, hmm. there's a, they, they, the Christians are oppressed. They're, they're not necessarily persecuted, but they're oppressed. They have to pay extra taxes. Mm -hmm. um, if, if a Christian is on a horse and he's going to pass a Muslim on, on foot, he has to get off the horse. There are all kinds of little, oh, okay. little things like that. <laughs> Interesting. And, you know, if I don't want to pay that extra tax and if I'm not really committed— why not become a Muslim? So there's yeah. this very gradual shift. Uh, and, and even today, you know, in 1900, still 20% or more of what we call the Middle East, Turkey, Iraq, Syria, um, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and Egypt, they were at least 20% and, and sometimes in some places anyway, more than that, were still Christian in 1900. That's amazing. So it's a it's a it's a very slow uh, shift, and I think actually, um, uh, in more recent times, the shift was slower because I don't think that uh, well the Ottoman Empire stopped requiring um, special taxes, I believe, of the Christians. So there was less pressure on mm -hmm. them to to convert. And then in the last hundred years, that number has very radically shifted very to where it's like what one two percent maybe well, in the yes, Middle East are Christian yes, now. Yes, it's it's. Um, the there's been um, Arab nationalism that usually has a Islamic kind of mm. aspect to it, and plus then these um, uh, there's been a revival of Islamism that uh, mm. that says you know um, Islam is it, and this is part of where the terrorism comes from. It's not just that, but and so it's become really hard to be a Christian in the mm -hmm. Middle East, mm -hmm. and um, it's not that they converted; they usually flee. They've, they've uh, come to, they've yeah. gone to Western countries yeah. uh, uh, or uh, South American countries mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's phenomenal where uh, you're saying it's back to going back a bit, but 788, mm -hmm. the fir first time it was like in, in conquest, a forced conversion yes. that the Christians, quote unquote Christians, yes. you know, are, are saying, well, not <laughs> only are we doing this just war thing, we're also like wrapping it into holy you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Ho holy yeah I guess yeah. that that is, is that the proper terminology to be using for like crusades and these things is like, this was a holy war. It was, of, yes. Yeah. It's, it's God. It, like the Pope said, God wills it. Yeah. And, um, you're defending the good people <laughs> and hopefully you're making some of the bad people become good people. The pagans become Christians. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, that's it's, uh, that's it's, so it's, cause we look at that now and be like, ah, that you know, because I mean the Crusades, I mean that, that was really messy. You mm -hmm, know, a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of horrible things happened. You know, yes. it's like how can that be holy? You know? Yes. Um well, um Europe at that time well, the, the Mediterranean world at that time was in a lot of chaos. Uh the Arabs had attacked and and conquered much of that area. Then soon after that the Vikings started ravaging Europe. And then soon after that, the Hungarians came in and caused a lot of trouble. And and it's soon after that that Europe sort of settles down. And that's when it becomes strong enough that it can actually start to oppose the uh. Muslims. But 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 from the time the Muslims invaded till you settled the Hungarians down, uh, Europe was in a Europe was in a state of chaos, lots and lots and lots of fighting. And at this point, the only people that probably really considered non-resistance were the monks and the nuns. They that that traditionally has been a part of being in a monastery. That 
we are not going to fight. And um, because the, one of their thrusts is to obey the Sermon on the Mount, which is what all Christians did in the early mm. church. And that's why they were non-resistant. Well, the, the monks, um, by and large, were non-resistant during the Middle Ages because that they were trying to live the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. There, there were eventually military monastic orders. Really? But it's during the Crusades. Oh, oh So okay. that's kind of an odd thing, you know, that, that pops is kind of up. Odd. Yeah, it is yeah, very, well, the, yeah. the, one, of the, the, one of the things that's really interesting is um, the last European country to be pagan was Lithuania. And their uh, duke wanted to marry the uh, princess in Poland, and he would then become the Polish king. And he would unite Poland and Lithuania. And that happened, but he was pagan. So he had to convert. And basically the nobles converted with him, but not necessarily all the people. So Lithuania was the last country in Europe to become Christianized. And the Teutonic Knights, who were one of these military uh, monastic orders, kept invading Lithuania because there were still pagans there. And finally, and the popes were saying, don't do that. It, you shouldn't coerce them. That This is interesting. Oh. The popes sometimes encouraged the coercion of crusades and sometimes didn't. And in this particular case, they said, uh, you shouldn't coerce them. Plus their leaders are Christian. It'll, it'll happen. So th th this is the last place where there were pagans and one of the monastic orders uh, fought wars. I think the last time they invaded Lithuania was uh, middle 1400s or so. And so things settled down and most Lithuanians became Christianized. But um, yeah, it, it, the, it, it was a very distable, unstable place yeah. uh, between the time of the invasion by the Muslims till things finally settled down after the Hungarians had settled. They, they had invaded from Asia and then they settled in Hungary. That yeah, that that is all quite bizarre. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. It, you know, and it makes us kind of appreciate um, <laughs> at least the current situation now is like yeah. you know, at least that's not happening. You know, it hasn't been endless conflict and mm -hmm. war. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, in our, in our lifetimes. Um, but okay, so we're we're looking at a a really kind of a wild story here of the Islamic conquests, you know, a hundred years conquering mm -hmm. all this territory. Um, mm -hmm. And then eventually the, the Christian-ish, whatever you want to call it, Christianized empires, you know, eventually really fighting back. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the Crusades. And then it started the, this forced conversion thing. I, I doubt that's all new to me. I mm -hmm. did not realize mm -hmm. that, that. It feels like that's a, a really seismic shift. Yes. You know. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That. So, so with this forced conversion thing, I mean, that's not obviously I don't think that's really happening now, but like no, that would have so. been a, a major part of mm -hmm. church policy, mm -hmm. church policy or government well, policy, was, like for a while or like, how does it was, it? well, like I said, um, there was actually conflict within the Catholic church. Some said, co um, convert, uh, coerced conversion is invalid and others thought it was okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they really settled in on it. If you were a, a, okay. a monastic, uh, person, a m person in a monastic military order, then you thought it was legitimate. And lots of times the Pope said, no, this is not the right way to go. You don't mm. coerce. Uh, even if they supported the, um, the crusade itself, I don't think they wanted co coerced conversions. I don't think so. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's still, yeah. it's, it's a, it, it, it's a thing that some of them were doing. Some mm -hmm. Christians were doing. And regardless on the forced conversion or not, there was very much the just war idea yes. is, is becomes very prevalent in this time. Well, even beyond it, though, because and, you now you're now doing God's will. You're not just defending yourself. You're actually uh, extending the kingdom. Yeah. Wow. That's sound. Yeah. <laughs> this that's like it kind of came, that's seems so bizarre to mix to go from like Jesus's teaching and how the early church was mm -hmm. and then somehow hijacking that and saying, now we're going to use that for conquest. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it just seems so, so weird and bizarre looking back at that now. Yeah. Um, where does that leave us today? Like, like what can we <clears throat> pull from this that says, yeah, okay, th there are definitely some lessons here, you know, or some things that were not good. Yeah. You know, well, you know, um, if you look at the, scriptures themselves, including the Old Testament, but I guess I'd say um, focus on the New Testament. Uh, everything there is talking about 
there is there is a government and God has established it, but it doesn't say anything about us being part of it. It says you pay taxes to them, you honor them, you mm. uh, obey them, but they they ha- bear the sword and they encourage us to do good. Those are the two two jobs of government: to encourage us to do well and to uh, bear the sword if there's need to settle down chaos or uh, um, whatever whatever happens that's not good. Christians are never told to do that. In, in the New Testament, it's always they who do it and we who do things like love your enemies, hmm. um, overcome evil with good. Uh, read Romans 12 and 13. All of 12 is what Christians do because they have the Spirit, and it's all about love. The first part of 13 says they will bear the sword. They uh, tell us how to live That's uh, so that we live well together. But you pay them taxes because they are ministers of God. That doesn't mean that they're a minister like the guy who gets up and preaches. They are serving God to hold chaos at bay. That's their job. And um, that's their job. Our job is to obey and to pay and to pray. And, um, and then right at, at verse 8, it starts in again on you, Christians, what you do. And we're supposed to owe oh, no man anything but love. We're, the whole, the whole of ch- the rest of chapter 13 is things that Christians can do with God's spirit, but a, a worldly person can't. Mm. So uh, the scriptures lay that out. Oh, Peter. I think it's in both Peters, but maybe more in th- uh, Second Peter. Um, he just talks so much about obeying the government, but they're probably going to oppress us. And, oppress us. and if you suffer for Christ. That's a, a thing that's worthy. This, the New Testament has that all throughout it. You ought to read sometime from the beginning of uh, the Gospel of Matthew all the way to the end and, and <clears throat> pay attention to how much it says we're going to suffer or that we're going to be misunderstood or that we're going mm. to um, you know, have to flee and things like that. It's all mm. through. Mm. Our, our job mm. is not to defend ourselves. Our job is not to... Um, well, what our job is, is to woo people into the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Um, and this this happened in the early church. People saw the Christians living so differently than the average pagan. Mm-hmm. And they started asking their Christian neighbor, why do you live like this? And it this is what drew people when they saw how Christians lived and how it was so different. Mm-hmm. In um, Colossians mm-hmm. and Ephesians, there are two lists of rules for the family. You know, wives love your husbands, uh, obey your husbands and husbands love your wives and fathers, uh, children obey your parents and fathers don't provoke your children and slaves obey your masters, etc. Um, those rules, those sets of house rules are 180 degrees the opposite of how a pagan lived. Marriage wasn't about, mm. I, I'm not saying it never happened this way, but marriage essentially was not about finding your soulmate, a person that you can you can help and she can help you. It was about having a family that you know is yours and passing on your inheritance to that those, those children. Uh, it makes no sense. <laughs> Paul says, slaves, obey your masters and uh, do it as though you're serving Christ. And then he says, masters, do likewise. Now, he doesn't mean obey your slave. He means the slave is supposed to honor you as a, per, as a person who's in the image of God and deserves a, to be treated with dignity. And you do the same to your slave. Now, all of this was 180 oh, degrees wow. different from even, yeah. even the husband and wife was 180 degrees different from how a pagan did. And so they saw this. They saw these people living so differently. We read those sets of rules and we say, so what? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's obvious. Well, no, we have that 2,000 years of practice that, and, and, mm. and it makes it seem normal. That wasn't normal in the world before. Oh, yeah, that's, that's phenomenal. Well, that, anyway, that's, it, the world is very different yeah. because of Christianity, even when people aren't Christians, than it would have been earlier. And I guess, I'm, I, guess I was probably trying to say that um, – the times when there were when when there was so much chaos in Europe and fighting and all that, we have to understand how those people, what the world looked like to them. Mm. But the the thrust of Christianity is to um, establish good relationships and live well with each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So as we've we've covered a lot of you know history and different yeah. pieces of this of the story here, and it, you know we um, wrap this all up into a nice package. What do people listening to this? What do they take from this? Like, what are some actionable pieces? Um, because mm-hmm. you know, sure, we're not living in the Middle East during you know yeah. the Islamic conquests and the yeah. church doing you know all these crazy things that were happening. Um, but what are some pieces people can take from this episode? Well. My major area of study was history. One thing I would ask people to do is do a little reading of church history mm, um, yeah. to try and get some uh, sense of what the church was like originally and, and how things changed. So that's one thing I would say. But you're asking about, okay, so today what do we do? Well, um, we are living in a time uh, – I'm going to talk to Americans. We're living in a time when when we are – fracturing and fragmenting into many, many little pieces and we're all at each other's throats. Mm. And Christians are getting involved in that. And we are supposed to be people that encourage good relationships and healing. And I know we're fallen and we have our problems, but we should not let ourselves get sucked into that. This is what happened as the church and state started coming closer together Mm. after Constantine. Christians got sucked into, well, you know, somebody has to uh, defend the border. Somebody has to rule this city and a Christian will do the best job. And eventually it became, well, obviously Christians have to do this. Christians have have to fight just wars and even holy wars. Um, We're at a time when there's, uh, when the church is being split and and people are getting at each other's throats and we need to rethink that. Uh, This is not, this Jesus doesn't, this isn't Jesus. Jesus is about um, healing, about forgiving, and about coming back together. And so um, that's, we are, we are at a really sad place right now in our country. Mm. And I would, I would say, um, start reading the scriptures, seeing what they're telling us that we should do. We need to be willing to suffer rather than to cause suffering. Mm. And, um, it's no different today than it was when the Roman government was pagan. The uh, The Christians suffered back then. And I think if we really want to live the Christian life, um, it may call us to suffering, mm. you know, mm-hmm. if we really want to do that, what, mm-hmm. we're, what we're called to do. And you had mentioned earlier how that's such a thread in the New Testament of mm-hmm. You will, you will suffer. You, you will you, suffer. You know, yeah. uh, so that's kind of a high, a high calling in a way mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. that you're, you know, telling people listening to this, like there will, there will be pain you yes. know, in this, but this is the right thing to do. But we Americans don't like that. No, we no, don't. No, we don't. And, and, and so <laughs> yeah. what we have to rel- realize is the question we should ask ourselves, am I imposing my, in, my, my American worldview on the scriptures or am I letting the scriptures impose Mm. itself on my American soul? And I think right now we're doing the other. We're letting the, the, uh, um, American worldview Mm -hmm. uh, shape how we read the new Testament. That's a, I think that's a critical piece of introspection Mm -hmm. that everybody listening to this should do because, because it's so easy. I know for myself, you know, the American, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mindset. It's so mm-hmm. easy to just project that onto mm-hmm. the text. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing, Mr. Russell. This, whew, this, we covered a lot on this one. And <laughs> this, this is a lot of stuff to think about. Okay. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share this with us today. Okay. Glad to do it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. If you found this interesting, we've interviewed Mr. Russell a number of other times, and you can find those linked down below. We also did an interview with Dean Taylor on Anabaptism and Muslims, and some of those interactions in the past is really, really fascinating uh, stuff there. So that's also linked down below. I encourage you to watch that as well. As always, you can find all of our content on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Mm